What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. It's time once again for Wednesday afternoon worship. This request also comes from Pathfinder Playtest All Rogue Game. This one comes from Buffalo. Jason, the GM, a good friend of mine. After this video, we will have one, count them, one more core deity, that of course being Rovagug, because today it's all about Lamashtu. If you guys are liking what you're seeing, hit that like and subscribe button, ding that bell. Stay caught up on all your Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition content. Today, this episode of Wednesday Afternoon Worship was brought to you in part by the man who requested it, Buffalo. Thanks for your time, man. Thanks for your support. Thanks for your games. Honestly, thank you for learning how to GM combats in Roll20 on the fly. That's brave. I applaud that, truly. But now, let's get evil. So I've seen a lot of different forums equate Lamashtu to a lot of things, some of which actually on Kingmaker this last Thursday, Lucia and I debunked, because I've seen a lot of equating to Demogorgon in 3.5. That's just not as correct, especially when you consider on planet Earth, Lamashtu was once worshipped. In Mesopotamian mythology, Lamashtu was a female demon, monster, malevolent goddess, or demigoddess who menaced women during childbirth and, if possible, kidnapped their children while they were breastfeeding. She would gnaw on their bones and suck their blood, as well as being charged with a number of other evil deeds. She's depicted as a mythological hybrid with a hairy body, a lioness's head with donkey's teeth and ears, that's terrifying, long fingers and fingernails, and the feet of a bird with sharp talons. She's often shown standing or kneeling on a donkey, nursing a pig and a dog, and holding snakes. She bore seven names and was described as seven witches and incantations, and actually, according to Mesopotamian mythology, one would invoke Pazuzu, yeah, to protect birthing mothers and infants against the Mashtu's malevolence. Although, of course, in Mesopotamian mythology, Pazuzu was said to be a bringer of famine and drought. There was a huge rivalry between him and the Mashtu, which also exists in Pathfinder. By the way, follow this card right up here. Learn about my favorite avian demon lord. Kind of the only avian demon lord. Whatever. Still cool. Now in Pathfinder, of course, all of the cool stuff comes to us in Inner Sea Gods, but today we'll crack open Book of the Damned for that sweet, sweet updated lore. In Pathfinder, of course, Lamashtu appears as a heavily pregnant human woman with the head of a three-eyed jackal, a raven's wings, a snake's tail, and vulture's feet. Her distended belly is crisscrossed with ragged scars, and she wields twin blades. Chillheart a blade which is made of sentient ice, and red lust, a blade made of sentient fire. Which actually is a pretty big callback to Devil May Cry 3's Agni and Rudra, a pair of living twin demon swords that, you know, become playable fire and ice weapons and like to argue, but are also Hindu gods. Anyway, moving forward, the length of these blades can vary from the length of a kukri to the length of a falchion, well, someone took monkey grip, didn't bet. In battle, of course, she prefers to wield the 2d4 over the 1d4. Lamashtu revels in destroying the most innocent, whether by defiling their flesh or tainting their minds. To her, a nursery is a banquet, and although she in fact is a fertility goddess, and mothers who created her are in fact more likely to survive childbirth, their offspring are inevitably tainted. She's called the Demon Mother, the Demon Queen, and the Mother of Monsters, though despite these titles, she's not the creator of the demon race, really just the first of their kind to have achieved true godhood. For this, of course, several demon lords loathe her and envy her power, but only Nauticula and again Pazuzu openly oppose her. While, of course, Lamashtu has far greater power on her side, Pazuzu has fewer responsibilities and can devote more time to toppling his ancient enemy from her throne. As a result, countless worlds bear the scars of immense conflicts that rise over time from the slightest of imbalances. The fact that Pazuzu has not been killed speaks to the bird's great tenacity. As one might imagine, Lamashtu is served by countless species of monsters, namely the gnolls, who claim heritage from Lamashtu, saying that when she first saw a hyena, she took it as her consort, and that's how the first Knoll was born, yeah, no. Lamashtu is in fact one bad mother, as far as a lot of these monsters are concerned. Other races, of course, also cite her as their race's progenitor through carnal conjunction with beasts. Yeah, fun. 
here we go again. This includes Lamias, this includes Morlocks, Goblins, Angry Azimars, and Rune Lords. That's a different story. As one might imagine, the Mother of Monsters, in fact, is Chaotic Evil. Her domains include Chaos, Evil, Madness, Strength, and Trickery, with the subdomains Cannibalism, Corruption, Deception, Demon, Chaos, and Evil, Ferocity, Insanity, Nightmare, Riot, Thievery, and Truth. Her favorite weapon is the Falchion, and her symbol, a three-eyed jackal. Now, Lamashtu is a goddess that has seen several reprints across, you know, several years of Paizo content, and she's a core deity, so one would expect that. And, as a result, she has both a deific and a demonic obedience, depending on where you're finding your lore, we'll do both. Both of these are kind of, again, on the NSFW side, viewer discretion is advised to perform Lamashtu's deific obedience. Sacrifice an unwilling living creature in the name of the Mother of Monsters. Draw the process out to inspire the maximum terror and suffering in your victim. The death blow you deal should be savage and destructive. Do not grant your sacrifice a clean death. Once the creature is dead, remove one of its bones and sharpen it to a point. Use that bone to cut yourself deeply enough to leave a scar. Leave the sacrificed creature's mutilated form in the open where scavengers may devour it, or travelers may see it and know of Lamashtu's power. In return, it's a plus one natural armor bonus to AC. That's not bad. Now, since that one is a little hard to fulfill, on the other hand, to perform Lamashtu's demonic obedience, one could engage in a tryst with the sincere intention of being impregnated or impregnating your partner, or sacrifice a creature that's been alive for no more than a week. Fun! Oh good! Baby killing! We did it! In return, it's a plus four profane bonus on saves against insanity, confusion, and polymorph effects. Though one might argue if you're off a of baby killing, you might already have those insanities. You might be a little confused and I don't know what to say about the polymorph effect. Regardless, fun times. Now, Lamash 2, much like Mephistopheles, and follow this card right up here, by the way, Devils and stuff, if you missed that one, has a lot of different boons reprinted across several sources. And of course, I would not do this video justice if we did not cover them all. We will start with Inner Sea Gods. So far as that book is concerned, Evangelist Boons grant us Summon Monster 1 thrice a day, Summon Swarm 2 times a day, or Summon Nature's Ally 3 once a day. At 16th level, your Eidolon gains the Frightful Presence evolution for free if you wish. Whenever you gain a new level in the Summoner class or the Evangelist Prestige class, if your aligned class has the Eidolon class feature, and you reassign your evolution points, you can choose to assign or remove the Frightful Presence evolution, but of course, once that choice has been made, you can't change it until you level up again. If you don't have the Eidolon class feature, you get Summon Monster 5 once per day as a spell like, but yeah, no, that's not bad. Frightful Presence on your Eidolon, or on you, Synthesis, flawless. And at 20th level, once per day as a standard action, you can summon a Baragara, which follows your commands perfectly, but if you're not CE, it eats you. You know, we've heard this one before. Exalted Boons. It's cause fear thrice a day, mad hallucination twice a day, or once a day fear. At level 16, your mind constantly swirls with dark whispers and disturbing thoughts. Yeah, you baby killer, I bet it does. You gain a plus four profane bonus on saves against mind affecting compulsion spells and effects against divination spells and effects that attempt to read your thoughts. Anyone who targets you with such a spell must succeed at a will save 10 plus wisdom plus half your hit dice or take wisdom damage. Suddenly you're a pseudo Lamia if they try to read your mind. That's kind of cool. I can dig it. Charm person? No. No, no. There's probably an AP where that's very powerful. Anyway, 20th level. Once per day, you can use Baleful Polymorph, except you change the target into a horribly mutated, classic form of the chosen animal. The target takes a minus four penalty on saving throws to resist. If the new form would prove fatal for the creature, it still gets the plus four, which would negate it, of course. In addition to the other effects of the spell, the subject is in constant pain from its twisted and disfigured form, and takes a d6 of non-lethal damage each round, which if you went down to one hit dice, kills you pretty quick. This, of course, imposes a minus two penalty on all of the target's ability checks, skill checks, saving throws, attack rolls, and damage rolls. Sentinel booms its stone fist thrice a day, bears endurance twice a day, or greater magic fang once a day. At 16th level, your jaw distends slightly, and you grow prominent canines. 
You gain a bite attack that deals a d4 damage if you're medium, or a d3 if you're small, plus half your strength. When part of a full attack, the bite attack is made at your full bat minus 5. You can also make a bite attack as part of the action to maintain or break free from the grapple. This attack is resolved before the grapple is attempted. If the bite hits, you gain a plus 2 on the grapple check, and any other grapple check against the same creature. And at 20th level, an armor like Epidermis of Thick Scars covers you, which gives you a minus 2 on charisma checks and charisma based skill checks. But DR5 over everything, if you already had damage reduction, like if you were a barbarian, you instead increase that DR by 5. Okay, that doesn't look bad on the geokineticist. Honestly, you can get huge DR over everything. Five more, why not? So pivoting real quick. Book of the Damned Evangelist Boons grant us lesser confusion thrice a day, touch an idiocy twice a day, or summon monster three once a day. At 16th level, you gain a beneficial deformity. Generally, this grants you a secondary natural bite, claw, tail, or tentacle, dealing a d6 of damage or medium if you're small, and you gain an additional ability with this extra attack, chosen from the following special features. Bleed 3, grab, trip, or 5 foot increase to reach with that natural attack. So that's fun. A secondary natural bite with reach greater than your longsword. Sure, that's not creepy. Good. At 20th level, a third eye opens in your forehead. This eye grants you dark vision 60, or extends it by 60 if you already had dark vision, and a plus 4 profane bonus on perception checks. Three times per day, you can activate as a swift action a gaze attack that lasts for a round. It's got a range of 30 feet, and it drives those who fail to resist its effects with a will save permanently insane. As per insanity, DC 10 plus half your hit dice plus your cha. Book of the Damned Exalted Boons. It's cause fear thrice a day. Mad Hallucination twice a day, or Waters of Lamash 2 seems appropriate once a day. At 16th level, your mind constantly swirls with dark whispers and disturbing thoughts. Literally is the same thing as before. Big buff on saves against compulsions and stuff. If they try to read your mind, they take wisdom damage, and a 20th monstrous transformation is also the same. Sentinel boons also track one for one from Inner Sea Gods to Book of the Damned. So I guess really we were just not happy with the fact that the summoner got a buff, is what I'm seeing. Okay, I see you, Paizo. In any case, of course, this creepy CE lady would have an anti-paladin code, and it goes as such. All things are monstrous, and only the weak hide their marks. I show the world as it is. I will bring the outcasts in from the cold and teach them the taste of victory. I fill the wombs, I birth the children. I teach our enemies why they fear the night. The monster's Batman. Neat. I bring madness to the cities, that in their blood and fear they may understand the chaos of the world. I will spread the mother's seed. If the blind cannot be taught to see, their children can. And as if that weren't enough, as of Planar Adventures, divine gifts are rolling. For the Mashtu, complete a crusade through an orphanage eating children, I suppose. And you can disgorge a servitor monster from your body as a full round action, although the monster views the character, you, as its mom, aww, and follows your general commands, although it can't be directly controlled. The exact type of monster spawned is chosen by the GM, but generally it's one whose CR is equal to the character level. The monster lives for nine days, after which it dies in a spectacular shower of gore. Okay, so break open the random tables. You're level 20, vomit a CR 20 thing. Gross. Even more gross for an epic level game. Can you get to level 30? Can you vomit a Cthulhu? Whoa, that's bad. That's nine days of real bad for everyone. Now, of course, like we said with Sukothbanoth, a lot of things involving the Mashtu, if you are a player who worships this deity, or if you are featuring it in your campaign, probably our best left failed. This, again, is kind of what Session Zeros are for. It's my personal policy that I want to trigger characters as often as possible, but I do not ever want to trigger players, and if this is bad, boom, X, not doing it. That simple. That said, the notion of the fact that pregnant cultists praying for Lamash 2's blessings might birth like a bar test or something along those lines is, you know, very one-of-a-kind flavorful. And creepy things like this also are definitely par for the course in a lot of evil games. Honestly, anytime I hear Lamash 2, I cannot help but think of the most famous, probably in terms of Pathfinder's own lore, Worshipper of Lamash 2, Nualia from Book 1 of Rune Lords, right? There's definitely a lot of room if she survives Thistletop for her to 
become a mother to monsters. Now, if I were to play a follower of Lamashtu, and honestly, I've been kind of thinking about that for a while, because she's kind of heavily-ish featured in a part of Kingmaker, I think the best fit comes in the form of the Sacred Huntmaster Inquisitor. You know, get your spells directly from Lamashtu and get real good at teamwork with something like a gigantic hyena or whatever monstrous whatever your GM will let you take into combat. Sky is kind of the limit on that one, and honestly, even if it was just like a really big hyena and I'm playing a knoll, seems super flavorful to me. What do you guys think about Lamash 2? Have we worshipped her? Have we used her in our campaigns? And what acts of depravity have you gotten up to? in your tabletop role playing. Of course, keep it clean-ish in the comments, you monsters. But that's all we have for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. It's a homebrew next week before we hit a bunch of the eldest. Next week, we're statting up the Furies. See you then.